All right, turning now to some developments around the war in Ukraine. Minority Leader Mitch McConnell took to the Senate floor yesterday to urge lawmakers, including members of his own party, to continue federal spending for Ukraine amid the ongoing war with Russia. The United States isn't arming Ukraine out of a sense of charity. We're backing a fellow democracy because it is in our direct interest to do so. This is American leadership. And Republicans should be pressing President Biden to show more of it instead of dreaming about America retreat. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, the BBC this morning cites Japanese and South Korean media outlets who are reporting that a space base in Russia's Far East may serve as the venue between a potential meeting of Vladimir Putin and Kim Jong-un. Video out of Russia this morning shows President Vladimir Putin touring the very same base. Reuters, the Associated Press, and other outlets have reported that Kim Jong-un is now in Russia. Joining us live from Dnipro, Ukraine, NBC News Chief Foreign Correspondent Richard Engel with more. Richard? Well, good morning. So that base, this uh, sort of a version of a Cape Canaveral, is a missile launch facility in the far east of Russia, not far from Vladivostok, is what seems to be the likely location where Kim Jong-un and President Putin will meet potentially tomorrow. Uh, Vladimir Putin wasn't giving any indications, uh, but he said that he does have a uh, a trip planned to this uh, launch facility. He says he has a trip uh, coming there soon. And uh, he told the, the reporters who asked him the question what he was going to do there. He said, you will see what happens when it happens. So something uh, appears to be planned for that uh, launch base. And there are new images that have just uh, just come out in the last uh, few moments, in fact, showing uh, the North Korean leader inside Russian territory, not far from that uh, launch base in the far east of the country. North Korean state television showed Kim Jong-un waving to top government and military officials as he left Pyongyang on his bulletproof train for Russia. And he has good reason to be smiling. As the slow-moving train crossed the Russian border, Kim is finally feeling needed, courted by President Vladimir Putin. Two of the leaders America is most wary of are coming together. Putin, attending an economic forum in the eastern city of Vladivostok, is expected to greet Kim with the full honors of a state visit. A new model of mutual relations and integration is being born, but not on a basis of Western standards, Putin said. There's a more practical reason for the rare summit, too. North Korea produces artillery and missiles, which it aims at South Korea, a close U.S. ally. But since the two Koreas haven't fought a war in decades, the North has vast stockpiles of the weapons, which Putin needs now to fend off Ukraine's American-backed counteroffensive. I think the fact that Russia is ha having to beg North Korea for military support speaks to the effectiveness of our sanctions. The weapons transfer would be a violation of international sanctions. But for two states already under sanctions, that could be little deterrent deals are already in motion. Putin's defense minister was in Pyongyang in July to discuss an arms trade. A top Chinese Communist Party member joined the Russian defense minister at a military parade. It's unclear what Putin would give Kim in return, but it's expected to include food and support for North Korea's advanced weapon systems. Kim just oversaw the launch of what North Korea called its first tactical nuclear attack submarine. President Putin's desire to keep this war here in Ukraine going has formed an alliance between China, Russia, and now North Korea. Mika. All right, NBC's Richard Engel, thank you very much for that report. We reported yesterday that Ukrainian officials are upset with Elon Musk as new information comes to light about the billionaire's influence in the war. In September of last year, Musk reportedly stymied a Ukrainian offensive against Russian military ships in Crimea by denying the Ukrainians access to his Starlink satellite network to prevent a drone attack on Russia's naval fleet. 
It's something revealed in Walter Isaacson's new biography of Musk, and we asked Walter about it on the show yesterday. It was the night that the Ukrainians were doing a sneak attack mm. on the Russian fleet in Sevastopol. And he told me that he wasn't allowing uh, Starlink to enable that. I got it slightly wrong. I thought he made the decision that night. But he said, no, previously they had geofenced off Crimea, but he didn't tell the Ukrainians that, so they thought it was working there. And that night, they're sending them all these messages. Uh, all these text messages are in the book of saying, you've got to let us use it in this fight against Crimea, I mean, against the Russian fleet in Sevastopol. And he doesn't. He says no. And at that point, I think he realizes he has too much power. I said, have you talked to Jake Sullivan? Nationally? Have you talked to General Milley? And that's when he decides he's going to just sell some of these to the U.S. military and let the military, the U.S. government, determine how they're used. And right. Applebaum, uh, whose new piece is titled, What Russia Got by Scaring Elon Musk. And good morning. So how did Russia scare Elon Musk? And was he duped by Vladimir Putin? Well, according to Isaacson and according to others, uh, Musk spoke to the Russian ambassador to Washington. He may also have spoken to Putin himself. At one point, he said he had and another he did not. And he was given the message that any attack on Crimea will have a nuclear response. And this is, of course, standard Russian propaganda. They seek to frighten Americans and Europeans and others with the specter of nuclear war. Um, and he, he believed that, he bought it, and he prevented the Ukrainians from finishing their attack last night. Uh, I think what the stories haven't shown, revealed yet is that actually, the same team that carried out that attack that was aborted in September tried it again in October, and the attack succeeded. These were sea drones. They hit um, one major Russian battleship. They hit several other ships as well. They hit a submarine. Uh, the attack was successful. Uh, and there was no nuclear war. So in other words, uh, Musk was wrong to have prevented it the first time. And it also indicates that um, the, you know, when the Ukrainians are allowed to carry out their attacks, when they're allowed to fight the way they want to fight, um, the Russians tend to step back because for a whole month after that October attack, when they hit the ships, um, no Russian ships left the port of Sebastopol in Crimea. And, you know, these are ships that are, that have missiles that hit Ukrainian cities, that kill Ukrainian civilians. Uh, so the attacks really save lives. The drone attacks save lives. They kept the ships in port. Um, and further, further uh, drone attacks since then have also made the Russian Navy more wary and more careful about what it does, which is a good thing. Yeah, and I, 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 the, the bigger question for me is how did the United States government ever get in the position where we allow one person to have so much power uh, over over communications and war zones. Uh, why why haven't we filled that void? Why why haven't why hasn't NATO, the EU, other other pro democracy uh, uh, countries and organizations filled that void? So I think the decision to to bring in Starlink at the beginning of the war was one of those things that was done very quickly as a kind of emergency. Um, people didn't really think it through. They didn't think of Musk playing some kind of role in the war. Um, since that incident and several other incidents, the Ukrainians have gotten other kinds of communications. So that second drone attack was carried out with a different system. Um, and as I understand it, some of Musk's um, influence is now reduced. Some of the Starlink uh, controls are, are now run by the by the military by the US military um, but you're right I mean the historically defense contractors once they sell their plane or their ship or their or their tank to the US government don't get a say in how those things are used so this was a very unusual situation um, and we have to hope it doesn't get repeated so Anne, you mentioned this idea that the Ukrainians when they've been able to carry out these daring operations they've been fairly successful and Russia hasn't done much in response. What do you make right now of this ongoing counteroffensive which has included dr drone strikes into Russia as, as part of this assault and and how much progress have they made enough progress uh, between now and the end of the fighting season to sort of make sure that their allies stay with them? 
One of the issues with the counteroffensive is that it was slowed down by the slow delivery of U.S. and European weapons. And some of that happened for the same reason that Musk cut off Starlink. Uh, people were afraid to give the Ukrainians long-range missiles, then they were afraid to give them tanks, then they were afraid to give them planes. You know, for there was this constant fear of, of the Russian response. Um, you know, some call it self-deterrence. Um, and the slow arrival of those weapons meant that the Russians were able to build up an enormous minefield, tank traps, um, a kind of defense system that almost no modern army uh, has ever had to cross. So while the Ukrainian offensive, counteroffensive rather, they're taking back their own territory, um, continues forward, it is, it, it is moving slowly. It is happening. Um, I think people had hoped there would be more by the end of the year. Um, but the Ukrainians keep showing um, that they're, they're willing to keep going. And right now, frankly, there isn't an alternative. The Russians have not given up on their major goal in this war, which is to occupy all of Ukraine and take over Kiev and destroy the country. And so it's not as if they have a choice. All right. The Atlantic San Applebaum. Thank, Thank you, you so very much. Always great to have you on.